Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist. And today, um, I want to do part two of the rope wrap node group, which um, last time we went over some of the nodes that are used in it, specifically um, creating edges between points and then um, taking an edge and turning it in, into a sagged curve. Today what I want to try to do is go through the rope wrap node explain each part of it and how it um, works. That's kind of a brief overview of what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to mask part of the input mesh, which is the beams. Um, and then on that masked part of the mesh, the downward facing parts, we're going to create a bunch of points. And then from between those points, we're going to use the node we talked about last time, the edges between points to create edges, and we're going to sag them. Then we're going to turn those into ropes. And then um, the other part is making the loops and turning those into ropes. Um, so that's the that's the quick overview of what it is and how it works. Um, let's get started. I guess the first challenge that we have to solve is for when we do the looped ropes, we want to try to align them to the beams. And I wanted to be able to support beams in any orientation and rotation in the world. Um, not necessarily aligned to an object space axis or a bounding box axis. Um, so we need a way, and, and I want it to work on each individual beam, not the object as a whole. So we need a direction per beam that's roughly the direction the beam is pointing. And that's what this beam direction node does. So beam, the beam direction is probably the most complicated part of the setup that I haven't discussed in part one. So um, let's go through it first because it's a it creates a vector that we'll need to use um, several times throughout the rest of the node group. So let's go through this node by node. We have our input, which is our our mesh. Um, we run a raycast against that. Um, I don't know if it mat. I don't know if raycast hits back faces or not. Anyway, I flip the faces just in case. I don't think I probably need this. Then um, for the raycast, we need a source position to raycast from, and we need a direction to raycast in. So the direction is going to be the opposite of our normal. So we have our normal, and if we scale that by negative one, that's the opposite of the normal. And then it, for the position, we want the position of the face, and we need to add just a little bit of the normal to it so that it doesn't hit itself. Um, so we're going to add the normal vector scaled to minus 0.01 to the position, which will move the origin point just a little bit inside of the mesh. And then we're going to raycast from that position in the negative normal direction. Then we're going to get the hit position if it is a hit. If it's not a hit, we're going to just assume that we looked a really long way in one direction. So we're going to scale our negative normal vector by 10 and use that instead of the hit position. If it's if there wasn't a hit, we don't can't use the hit position. So it's a that so that's a fallback in case something doesn't quite work out. Then we want to capture that position that we hit on our face. So you can imagine that as just as a example case, we have this face here. It's normal points in this direction. So we're going to get the opposite of that, which points in this direction. And we're going to raycast in, which should hit on the opposite side right here. And so this point is what gets stored on this face over here. And each face is going to have one of those. But the idea is that from this face, it should go all the way up to here before it hits. And, and, that, and that vector is going to be longer than the vectors going across. And so we'll be able to pull the longer vectors out of our set of vectors. By the way, if anyone thinks of a better way to do this, it feels like there should be a better way to calculate the direction of each. But this is the best method I've come up with so far. Once we have that position that the ray casts hit, we're going to subtract the original position of the face, which will give us a vector from the position of the original face to the point that its ray cast hit. So we have that direction. Then we have a problem because theoretically we want the vectors from these four faces here. 
and these four faces here, because those are the ones that should have the longest results. But we have a problem because half of those faces have a vector pointing in this direction, a normal vector, and half of them have a normal vector pointing in this direction, which will cancel each other out essentially. So, so to try to solve that, um, I have this node group called sine of largest component, and it's pretty simple. All we do is we separate the x, y, z of the, that vector, and we're going to figure out which is x or y larger, and we're going to get that value. And then we're going to say, is the larger of x and y larger than z? And we're going to get the larger of those two values, and then we're going to figure out the sign. Is it positive or negative? Once we have that sign, we can scale the vector by the sign. So if the longest component in the vector is negative, we're going to flip it to be positive. So theoretically, then the only time you would have a problem is if you had something pointing exactly 45 degrees. Um, I'm not sure what would happen then because the longest vector would sort of tie between X and Y. Anyway, there's always an edge case, I guess. So then we can take the length of that vector of all of those vectors from every face and we can accumulate the total of them the total length of them in a accumulate field node and we want to group those by the island index so this is island this b might be island one and this one might be island two and this one's island three etc for each of those we're going to accumulate a total and then we're also going to accumulate um a field that is the just increases by one every time. Then we have the length of our vector again, which is redundant. We can get rid of that. Um, so then this divide node gives us the total length of this, the sum of all of those raycast lengths divided by the total number of faces, which gives us the average length of a raycast. And then we can add some value to that as a as a threshold, just as to so we can tweak it if we need to. And then um, we can check if the length of our particular face's raycast was greater than the average length. And if it was greater than the average length, then we will keep the edges that are longer than the average. So the way we'll do that is we'll take our direction vector that we calculated for each face, and we'll scale it by this Boolean value. True or false is the length of this direction greater than the average for the entire group. Um, and that looks like this. It's true on the endpoints, but not on the rest of the mesh. So then that's essentially a mask of our end, end caps only. So if we scale our vectors by that, we get this, where only the ends have values. If we then accumulate all of those values by group, we get this result, which is where each beam has its own vector. And the color of that vector is determined by the direction that the beam is rotated in, essentially. So that's the first thing done. We have completed one node of the group. How many minutes in are we? That's, so that's an important piece that we need later. Now let's leave that for now, and we'll start at the very beginning over here, which is where we again have our mesh as the input. And now what we want to do, our first goal is to spawn some ropes hanging between or underneath the beams. So the first thing we want to do is mask by the normal. This node is pretty simple. Um, the way it works is we're just going to separate the geometry, either on the point or the face. Um, both work pretty well. We're going to do the dot product of the normal against the vector that we want to match. And then we're just going to check if it's greater than our threshold value or not. And that's going to be our selection. So that gives us here, we have this world space upwards vector. And then our threshold, we can make it more or less inclusive. And we're going to take the inverse of that, um, which is the bottom, the downward facing bits. And we're going to scatter points on or no, wait. First, the other thing I did was since I have bevels on it, I um, do an attribute statistic on the face area, and I select the faces that are greater than the average face area. Similar concept to the direction. Um, and that gets rid of these beveled edges, essentially, which I wanted to do because um, 
I was getting some weird results on the ends. If your input mesh isn't beveled, then these nodes here probably aren't really necessary. So then we're going to create some points on those faces that we masked out. And once we have those points, we're going to um, use the node we looked at in part one to create edges between those points. And the number of edges we create is controlled by our rope count. And then we have, um, so you can see that here, our rope count goes into the edge count. And then the seed is just lets us get varied results depending on the seed. So those all just go into random values. Then the edge sag is next. The other node we looked at in part one. And we're just going to set the sag amount to be a random value that's different per rope. Once we have our edges that are sagged, they're ready to be turned into ropes. The other ropes we want to create are the loops going around the beams. And the way we can do that is by creating a grid, just a plane, a two, ver a two vertex by two vertex grid, and instancing those on the endpoints of our curves. So if we, let me take this out real quick. So that looks like this. Then we want to use that direction vector that we started with. Um, and we want to create a rotation that aligns to that vector. And we're going to use that as the rotation for these planes. And that makes the planes align with the beam. Let me just join these. That makes the, um, the input beams align with the planes. And you can see if we rotate these around. They stay roughly with the normal of the plane facing um, the same direction as the beam. The only tricky thing about that is because this is calculated on the beam's face we and we have points that we created, we do have to sample the nearest face of our input geometry that we calculated the direction for and then that gets us an index of a face and then we want to sample the index of a face to get the vector from our that's our beam direction. So once we have our planes instance on our beams at the end points of our curves that hang between the beams, we want to create copies of those because each of the planes is going to turn into a rope that wraps around the beam. Um, so we want to create, you know, between maybe two, three and five loops for each of the where each of these planes are. So we're going to need to make some copies of it. We can do that with a duplicate elements. Um, before we do that, we should realize the instances to turn them into a mesh. And then we're going to duplicate the elements a random number of times between two and five. And you could tweak that, obviously. So now we have duplicates all in exactly the same location. So we want to move each duplicate a little bit further along the beam. And we're going to use our direction we calculated at the very beginning again. We're going to bring it up here and normalize it so that it's exactly one unit long. And then we're going to scale it by a tiny amount in the negative direction so that our ropes that wrap around the beam, instead of starting right at the rope that loops between beams and then going in one direction, it starts on one side of the rope that connects between beams and then goes past it. So we're going to go in the negative direction a tiny amount, set the position of everything offset that way a little bit. And then we're going to scale our normalized beam direction by a random amount, but the very small amount, the distance we want between our rope loops. And we're going to then scale that value. So say it ends up being 0 0.05 is the distance we want between ropes. We're going to multiply 0 0.05 or scale that vector times the duplicate index, which is going to start at zero and then increase by one for each copy. And that gives us this result here. At this point, there are two paths that both do the same thing, and that's because we have this precise checkbox. The first path goes through this way, and it um, converts these planes into edge loops and then shrinks, basically shrink wraps them around the beam. That's the faster way. The other way um, goes this way, and it uses a boolean to slice the beam where the planes are. Um, which makes the wrap a lot tighter and more even, but it is slower. So we'll go through the shrink wrap one first because it's simpler. Um, we want to delete geometry only faces. That gets us just the edges left. Then we want to subdivide it once to make it give us a little more geometry to work with and make it a little rounder. And then we can add some noise. Honestly, I don't think that is noticeable. <laughs> Then we're going to set the position of those loops to be 
at the sampled nearest position of our input geometry plus a little bit of the sampled nearest normal of our input geometry, which looks like this, which works pretty good in some cases if you have bits close together. If you have bits of rope close together, it can get really weird. Um, that's why the precise does a little bit better. The other way is once we have our uh, planes to slice, we can use a intersection boolean operation, which is quite a bit slower, which gives us this result. Um, for some reason, it sometimes keeps faces from the original, and other times it doesn't. Um, it's a little annoying, it just means we have to try to get rid of these duplicate bits. Um, the way we're going to do that is we're first going to delete all of the faces where the absolute dot product of the face normal is less than 0.5 when you do a dot product against the direction of our, the normalized direction of our beam again, that very first thing we looked at. So that gets rid of everything except um, the faces that are pointing, who, the faces whose normal match the beam direction and possibly the very ends of the beams, which is why we have this next node, which is delete duplicates. Um, and all delete duplicates does is it takes the our original mesh and we do a proc geometry proximity on the vertices, on the points. And then we just check if the distance between points is less than a threshold and we delete them if that's true. So it assumes that a vertex on the original mesh will be more than 0 0.001 away from the new edges that are cut by the boolean. Then after that, it's identical to the method with the shrink wrap. We're going to delete only the faces. Then we're going to merge by distance because the boolean sometimes creates edges in the same place. Again, the perturb that's hardly noticeable. And then uh, we're going to turn the mesh into a curve, which is, gets us back to the same point we are at with the non-precise method. So we have precise, non-precise. Then we're going to do a switch. We're going to switch on the input, precise. And then we're going to join our geometry to our sagging ropes. So now we have all the rope curves in one geometry. After that, uh, it's a pretty simple check do we want the high poly ropes or not the high poly ropes and we plug that into a curve to rope node which looks like this you can see if we turn high poly on we get twisted ropes that look really nice if we turn high poly off we get just uv unwrapped curves then after that i have a uv transform just to for texturing purposes and then i have the a set material which sets it to the material that you pick in the modifier from the input and then we're going to join all of these ropes back in with our original beam. Oh yes, this node is just so you can see if you can, if you want to preview the wrap because especially if you turn precise off you get better results if the size of this plane is close to as close to the beam as possible. So that's all this is here. It's just a switch to show the pl to add the planes into the result or not. And then down here at the bottom, this is our input geometry, which we should honestly just put over here because I don't like having edges that go all the way across. There we go. Nice and tidy. Those are all of the steps in this rope wrap node group to create points, to hang curves between, and then at the ends of those points, wrap rope around the beams, and to support having the beams be oriented in any direction um, with any number of beams and any number of ropes that you want to have. The only thing it doesn't do is detect if the rope goes through a beam. <laughs> anyway, that's it for now. Um, the This node and all the other ones, here are a few of them, are available on my Gumroad page um, for free, or if you want to give me something for them, I always appreciate that as well. And then I've got more to come, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for watching.